should be recording, hopefully. OK, looks like I am. So. Welcome to the first lecture for um, cannabis management. And. Um, you know, the PowerPoints up there if you ever want to look back through it. Uh, but. Got this recording as well. Actually. Probably gonna have to check my time here and there, but all right. So this is really an overview of you know the early origins of hemp, of what we can find out there, what people have found, like archaeological digs, what's written down um, in old books and everything like that. So we really start out at the beginning, which is kind of fun. And then we'll move through time, um, kind of follow like the ups and downs of it until we get to really just the last few years. Um, and then when we do talk about regulations, um, I'll, I'll at least get into the regulations as far as hemp goes, because that was the farm bills that came out um, several years ago, 2014, 2018. Um, but actually getting into like the newer stuff that just was um, approved earlier, was it this year, 2001, um, but adult use marijuana. Um, we will get into that. It'll just be on a separate lecture. So, uh, <clears throat> I thought I'd just start out with this um, because I'm going to try to use the same terms for like whatever it is I'm talking about. And so I just wanted you to be aware. You'll see this a lot when we talk about regulations and the legislation, um, but how the laws for our state, at least, I mean, most of the states out there, but that define hemp. You know, it is still the cannabis sativa plant, so it is still closely related to what you would call marijuana. The only difference is that the Delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol, which is THC, I'll probably always call it Delta 9 THC after this, um, but that concentration cannot be more than 0.3% on a dry weight basis. So what that means is that um, that's how we kind of separate or define hemp versus cannabis. Um, you know, they do not mean the same thing, uh, but a lot of people choose as far as what they're going to call marijuana. Um, you might hear it called like high THC cannabis, you might be, have it be called just cannabis. Um, some people call it marijuana still, adult use cannabis. Um, you know, this is for that plant cannabis sativa that contains more than 0.3% um, Delta 9 THC on a dry weight basis. So it's really all about the concentration of Delta 9 THC. And so throughout this class, when I talk about hemp, I mean that first definition that it's any of the products and any part of the plant that has less than 0.3% THC. Um, and so you will not get high off of that, does not contain enough THC to alter us in any way. And, you know, especially we'll get into the specifics of how hemp can be further kind of grouped into three different plants. One's bred for fiber production, one's bred for grain production, and then ones that were bred for CBD production. But we will get to talk about um, marijuana because that's part of the new legislation that came out now making it legal, um, not only medical marijuana, but also adult use recreational marijuana. So we will talk about that too. And so I'm either going to say hemp and marijuana, or I might say hemp and high THC cannabis. Right? I might sometimes even just call it cannabis. That's not exactly correct, and I don't like it that I do that because it's all from the cannabis plant. 
Um, but I just wanted to list that out here to make it clear that when I say hemp, I mean the first definition. And then there's a few terms I use for the second one, but I will try to keep it relatively the same. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I will try to keep it the same throughout the class and say using the term high THC cannabis or marijuana. All right, and hopefully nobody has a problem with using the word marijuana. Um, obviously there is some history with it that we will talk about. That is a little bit of like racially biased. And so some people do consider marijuana to be um, a term that re just relates to, again, I guess being racially biased, um, but it's still commonly used out there and even our laws use the word marijuana. So I might use it or I might say high THC cannabis. But anyway, let's get that out of the way. So start at the very beginning. Um, a lot of unique ways that hemp's been used. Uh, again, hopefully it's just really interesting to you if you've never seen any of this before. Um, but really we can kind of trace the history really, really far back to about 8000 BC where um, they found traces of hemp in modern day China and Taiwan. Um, you know, from archaeological archaeologists that were digging. Probably most of it was like seed and oil from grain hemp. Um, so it wouldn't have had high THC. They wouldn't have been getting high off of it, but it doesn't mean that that doesn't come in later. Um, but that's just mostly what they found. <clears throat> um, evidence of it and like pottery, um, you know, tracing some of that. Uh, I guess, you know, whatever they can find in their digs. So, you know, when you consider that human agriculture started about 10,000 years ago, you can definitely assume that hemp was one of the first agricultural crops that they did place an importance on, you know, in certain areas of the world. It does spread over time. Um, next, we can kind of find uh, references of to hemp, although they called it um, sacred grass. And uh, I'm not going to be able to pronounce that name, but the Hindu sacred text that means science of charms referred to the plant as sacred grass um, because it was one of the five sacred plants of India. And again, they probably used it for a number of reasons. Um, they probably again used the seed and the oil in the seed for um, eating, you know, cooking. Um, they could have used the fiber from the plant, whether that was for rope or for clothing. Um, and then they might have found some that were again high in THC. They might have noticed some of the medicinal benefits that came from using that. You know, didn't necessarily have to be THC though. Um, CBD and other cannabinoids have medicinal um, benefits, applications, so can't necessarily say that it was marijuana, but um, and again, just being important for a lot of these civilizations and as they moved around the world, um, it spread with them. So um, again, hemp, most likely fiber and grain hemp being used um, evidence of hemp rope found in southern Russia, um, finding again hemp seed and leaves in Germany, continues to spread across northern Europe into Greece, you know, and then we're obviously going to have those big civilizations that are spreading it around, and especially as they um, used the hemp rope and fibers to make their sails on ships, and they could then you know, conquer the other continents of the world and again spread hemp there as well. Um, hemp being used to make paper in China. Hemp rope is probably a pretty common one. Um, so I guess, yeah, pretty much we're moving closer and closer to zero BC. 
and then we start counting back up and for the AD. So there's a, a good amount of years skipped between each point, but there's just a lot of um, interesting facts that you can find. Um, I've got a book, I should have grabbed it, but I've got a hemp book that talked about a lot of these historical facts. So, um, you know, evidence of hemp material have been found in Asia, Europe, Africa, and being then spread to South America, North America. Um, and, you know, again, fibers going to make clothing, paper. Um, they're still probably also growing the grain part of it too for the seeds, the oil. Um, and then, you know, just again, growing along with this plant, making um, technology to help them manufacture the paper easier, help them, you know, mill it down from the long strands of fiber and whatever it is that they need. So <clears throat> keep moving on and on. Um, Yes, again, getting closer and closer to current times. Um, and again, you have civilization spreading, especially across oceans. Um, you have to think about like Vikings, they had hemp, they took that with them wherever they went. Um, when England spread to North America, South America, um, they brought hemp with them as well. So, <clears throat> the colonies had to um, raise hemp. So say some of them came across the ocean on their ships, settled in you know, New England area, and King Henry VIII, King of England, um, basically said they had, you know, he sent a bunch of hemp seeds with them and said you had to grow a certain amount of hemp there um, or you'd be fined. And so hemp was actually kind of treated as like part of the tax they had to pay. Um, so they would grow it, harvest it, and have to ship it back to England. Um, but that just goes to show how important the plant was to people at this time because they used it for so many different things. For their clothes, for their shoes, for their paper, you know, for their structures, their houses. Um, you know, when you have a single plant, they can kind of do everything, the food, fiber and fuel because you could get oil from the seeds for the fuel part um, and food. The seeds are definitely um, healthy and have a lot of protein and vitamins and everything, um, but they're probably not like a huge amount of food, but it still did a little bit, you know, a lot of fiber, a lot of fuel, a good amount of food, and it just made it so important to the people of that time. So um, farmers had to raise hemp. Um, again, you have it being introduced to other areas that they're traveling to like South America. Jamestown, the first English settlement in the Americas have to grow hemp again because they use it in so many different ways. So there's, I don't really, can't really find old pictures that show what this kind of looks like, but you know, we do have areas in New England where they like maintained those old houses and structures and people dress up like they did in those times. Um, so they are actually showing you here how they would have um, kind of gone through the separating of the fibers from the whole plant. Um, so these are like more current day pictures, but nonetheless. Uh, so hemp arrived in North America, you know, with the new settlers and Puritans that were coming over. They typically brought, you know, a ton of seed with them for planting because um, again, they used it for so many reasons. You know, and there was fiber and the ships that they sailed and the sails and the caulking of the Mayflower. Um, typically, British sailing vessels were never without a store of hemp seed, and Britain's colonies were compelled by law to grow hemp, as I already mentioned. And so, again, what kind of a few facts of why hemp was just kind of 
the overall choice of the time. Um, it was especially nice for the maritime uses, you know, those ships, because it had a natural decay resistance. Um, you know, it was very easy to grow. Um, it was adaptable to a lot of different environments. And you have hemp making the ropes, the canvas for the sails. Um, so each warship and merchant vessel required miles of hemp line and tons of hemp canvas, which meant that, you know, New England or England's hunger for the commodity was great. So that is why everybody had to grow them. Um, <clears throat> and it was still important also for the people that came over to North America because again, they could grow enough of it to even support themselves. So it was an important part of the economy for New England. Um, growing it, you know, south to Maryland and Virginia, um, north, Massachusetts, you know, New York, all of that probably even grew it up farther north. Um, they produced cordage, cloth, canvas, sacks, and paper from hemp over the years leading up to the Revolutionary War. And again, most of the fiber was destined to be sent back to Britain, um, but some of it was used for domestic purposes. So, you know, George Washington grew hemp. We're going to get closer towards the revolution too, but Thomas Jefferson actually bred some improved hemp varieties. Um, and again, we have continually increasing, you know, ways of managing to get the fiber out of the plants um, to kind of process it to get it down to a form that they could use for whatever they're using it for, for rope or paper. I will toss in though that, you know, when the first settlers came over to North America and obviously they had a lot of um, introductions to Native Americans, didn't necessarily speak the same language, um, but as they were kind of, you know, living together and getting to know each other and kind of learning how to talk to each other, um, there was an indigenous species, so that means it was native to North America, um, that Native Americans called Indian hemp. So, you know, when the name hemp was being used and they finally like were able to show the Indians what they, what that meant, they might have said like, oh, we have our own indigenous species of hemp, um, but it is actually not related whatsoever, as you can see here. It's Aposinum cannabidum, um, but it's not in the same genus or family as Cannabis sativa. Um, it was called Indian hemp though because, um, again, it had a lot of similar uses, fibrous stems. Um, I think Indians did use the seeds for medicinal purposes as well, uh, but it is not the same plant as hemp and not at all what you know, the settlers were talking about when they came over with the introduced species cannabis sativa. So cannabis is not native here, it was introduced. But if you hear the somebody talking about the plant Indian hemp, you should now know that it means something totally different. So anyways, um, it's kind of like maybe an ironic part of history that, you know, Britain was requiring <clears throat> um all of the settlers to grow hemp and they had to ship it back but they saved some for themselves they made paper out of it and so as we get to the um revolutionary war we did you know the u.s founders did write the declaration of independence on hemp paper um their early drafts as well as i believe our actual Declaration of Independence that you know, they've got in the museum is on hemp paper. So, just kind of, maybe it's ironic, I don't know. Um, so even though the war happens, we separate from um, England, you know, not having a monarchy, 
we still continued to grow hemp because it was still important for everyday life. Uh, so, like I said, a lot of our presidents grew it, um, not only for food and fiber, but again, using the seed oil um, as a fuel, which back then really was just like fueling lamps and stuff like that. But we'll see. We'll see as time goes on, the changes in technology. So we got the Declaration of Independence that was written on hemp paper. Um, they actually also started when using it to make like sails and ropes, they did use it to make flags as well. So our first um, flags for the United States were on hemp fiber. Um, and then again, for the ship there, you know, we built our own ships being our own country now. So we use them in the rail, the sails and the ropes and everything like that for our own ships. So it was still a really important part of our agriculture and production. Um, so. Oh yeah, just some fun facts. Uh, more than 120,000 pounds of hemp fiber was needed to rig the 44 gun USS Constitution, America's oldest Navy ship, affectionately called Old Ironsides. Nearly 55 tons of fiber was needed for the lines and the rigging on that vessel alone. Even more hemp fiber went into making canvas for sails and caulking for the wooden hull. So just kind of interesting. But <clears throat> again, time goes on. Um, we get into I think I'm getting into the 1800s. Uh, you know, we're still growing a plant. It's still very important to us. We're finding new ways um, to, you know, deal with the processing of the plant, separating, you know, pulling apart the fiber from the stalk, um, even separating it out into two different types of fiber. You'll see that later. So, and we got an industrial revolution that comes up. So we're using more and more um, of these things with wheels and pulleys and <clears throat> maybe a little bit of mechanized equipment. So. Yeah. Um, you know, again, there's some facts that are published here and there for different states. Um, this is a fact for Pennsylvania that there's over 100 water powered mills for processing hemp fiber in Lancaster County alone. So obviously, again, a lot of people growing it, a lot of people using it. We have to find ways to process it then. And there are also many hemp seed oil mills that press, pressed the excess hemp seed into oil. Um, that could be used for a number of ways for fuel, for paints, for ink, varnishes. I think maybe later they also find out that, you know, it's edible, can be used for cooking as well. We come up to this kind of interesting, like, side note of history. Um, <clears throat> the War of 1812, maybe it's slightly familiar to you if you took like a American history class, or if you remember it from high school, you know, I remember talking about it just briefly. But most of I think what we hear about is that like, you know, Napoleon wanted to take over the world. So he was the instigator of the of the war and we all had to fight against him so that he couldn't do that. Um, in actuality, Again, it's just a weird side note, a weird, a weird fact, um, because American schools definitely don't talk about this. They don't talk about hemp because, you know, as we're going to see, hemp becomes combined with marijuana, and so it's awful and bad for us. So schools do not talk about it at all. But hemp was actually the center of the conflict for the War of 1812. Um, and Americans did play a really big role 
in illegal Russian harm trade with England from 1807 to 1812. So we were very much a part of this and it was hemp that kind of started it all, which is interesting. But again, you have to remember that hemp was being used for so many things. Um, it was so important for the Navy, you know, all of those ships that they have. And if there were, say, somebody to come around like Napoleon who wanted to try to conquer the world, well, to get everywhere, he would need to be on a ship. And to have a ship, you need to have hemp. So it was an extremely important natural resource of the day. And actually, the best hemp came from Russia. And um, when Napoleon was like, I'm going to like kind of fuck with everybody, he cut off Britain's access to the Russian hemp. Um, and so the British actually forced American sailors to be their middlemen under the threat of impressment. So, you know, again, we're, you know, we did separate from England. We're our own country now, but we're all out here on ships. The British would capture the American sailors and tell them, you know, if you want to be free, you have to be our middleman and go collect the hemp product from Russia and bring it to us. And so <clears throat> it was actually this interference in American trade and sovereignty that President Madison cited as his chief justification for declaring war. Um, but they, you know, we did not go to war with um, the United Kingdom, um, England. We, we joined them to fight France and Napoleon um, so that all the trade routes would be open again and England could go back to doing their trade with Russia and all of that. Um, so it's just kind of interesting. Uh, some of the American sailors, you know, did go to Russia to get hemp for England, but they did bring some to the U.S. as well. Um, <clears throat> England actually did pay the American traders gold in advance, which probably helped, and then paid more when the hemp came in and they were allowed to keep some of that hemp to bring back to the U.S. and also trade their own goods with Russia. So it was kind of like a double profit for us. We weren't necessarily complaining, but then of course, um, you have Napoleon that has a pretty good control um, over his allies and um, I think he basically convinces Russia to no longer trade with American ships um, or any of the other European countries. And so, you know, we all kind of joined together then to fight Napoleon so that we can go back to having open trade with everyone. So, um, so yeah, you know, over time, several years this occurred, but in 1812 is when the United States did get cut off from its Russian hemp supply. Um, and so they were pretty upset with that. And they declared war. I might have some facts wrong there because again, I'm not an expert of history, but it's just kind of a fun, weird side note that um, a lot of schools out there, you know, teach teach this war in their own ways, and most of it, there's like no mention of hemp, and and it's just kind of funny because it's like literally why the war happened, but. <clears throat> Um, right. So we move past the 1800s. Um, probably not a lot of change as far as like hemp's 
importance to people. Um, although we do have, you know, newer and newer technology coming out. Um, you know, automobiles, things like that, um, that rely more on fuel like gasoline and, you know, we've got electricity, so we don't really have to burn um, lamps and the oil in the lamps anymore. Um, but it was still used for a number of reasons. Again, clothing. Um, although I will say I can't create like a perfect timeline, but on the next slide, I do mention that kind of the mid 1800s, late 1800s, um, we start getting introduced to a few other fiber crops like cotton and uh, Yeah, we'll talk about that. But so, so there are other plants um, starting to be grown, you know, as well. Um, a lot of trees around, so it's also kind of like, you know, cut down the trees in order to make room for people, but then we can also use those logs for furniture and paper as well. And then kind of the other big thing that's happening as we get into the 1900s is that there are some you know, whether you want to call them strains or varieties of cannabis that do have high levels of THC, the Delta 9 THC, which is that main ingredient that gives people that high that they talk about when you, you know, smoke or eat or however you partake in marijuana. So <clears throat> a lot of that was being produced in Mexico. Um, who knows if it was just, you know, like growing the plant in South America started to up that THC um, or if it was some like specific strains that they brought over. Can't really tell you that part, but there was a good amount of it being grown in Mexico and then they were bringing it up into the US you know, for recreational use. Um, and really, really when this started, um, when they started catching, you know, more and more marijuana coming up from the south, and um, that kind of immediately started escalating, like public fear and government concern about marijuana usage. And so you, like, literally, really early on in the 1900s, start to see, hear about marijuana menace, and you know, and like um, <clears throat> that this is a you know, product of a plant that is in connection with violence, crime, um, other socially deviant behaviors, primarily committed by racially inferior or underclass communities. So, you know, it started like right away with a lot of fear about marijuana. <clears throat> Maybe they didn't quite join hemp in the same group as marijuana because they were still growing it for fiber, um, for the textiles, for the paper. But then in the 1930s, we get the Great Depression, um, which showed a lot more people using marijuana, you know, probably due to the stressful lives of the Great Depression, but it also led to an increased public, public resentment and fear of Mexican immigrants and so by 1931, 29 states had actually outlawed marijuana. Um, I don't know like how efficient they were at um, you know, making sure it didn't come into their state. And I don't know which states those were either. Um, but you did start to see some, you know, state governments responding to this. You also have the creation of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics or FBN. Um, I put it there as a 1938. I believe it was 1931 or 1932 when that actually was formed. Um, but Harry J. Anslinger, you know, was the first commissioner of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. And then you have some federal laws being made that in response to um, you know, what people consider to be drugs, 
like marijuana. Um, there's just a lot. There was a lot of like advertisements, like before movies and newspapers, um, you know, that were really like connecting marijuana to crime and social problems. And so the federal government was like, we have to take action. Um, honestly, the first thing they did was create the Marijuana Tax Act that just placed a tax on all cannabis sales. And it, it because they called it cannabis, that included hemp as well. So didn't, I mean, it, it probably discouraged some production of hemp because maybe some of them were farmers that didn't have a ton of money. And, uh, you know, they maybe were like, we can't pay this tax, so we can't grow the plant anymore. For other people, it was probably, you know, for other people, it was probably, oh, okay, there's a tax on the sales. That's okay. We can pay that, no problem. So, might have started cutting down production of hemp a little bit. Not a ton, though. Um, but it's also about the time where they came out with this like 10 minute like movie reel that they played before movies that was called Reefer Madness. Um, you can find this movie on YouTube. I'm not going to show it because it's awful, um, very derogatory and <laughs> very much blaming, you know, lower class racially in inferior people um, on the problem of marijuana being present, but you can find it on YouTube uh, if you really wanted to look at it. And it's what was shown to people like before movies. Um, yeah, probably, I think, I think that's it. I'm not sure if TVs were made yet because we're at that, that was like the 50s. Anyways. Um, so you've got the tax act that started, um, but the, in the background, the Federal Bureau of Narcotics is still strongly encouraging state governments to like accept responsibility for control of the problem because they wanted to pass this uniform state narcotic act, um, which we do eventually get there, but anyways. Uh, because hemp is still around, people are still growing hemp. Again, you can't get high off of it. Um, there's articles written about how hemp could be used in 25,000 different products. Uh, we'll see how Henry Ford kind of take his, takes advantage of hemp. Um, Uh, I didn't really talk about World War One too much, but again, it would have been fiber, the hemp fiber would have been used during World War One because again, a lot of it would have been ships and things like that. Um, but as we again move towards different types of transportation, airplanes don't necessarily need hemp as much anymore. Um, we also, like I mentioned, have cotton introduced. It has you know, the fibers from the seed here um, that can be used, again, clothing, I guess, structures, um, curtains, sails, things like that. Um, so I've started putting arrows on some of the slides to show when um, production of hemp and maybe even the overall view of hemp starts to decline. So, you know, even with new technology that perhaps maybe makes it easier to handle hemp and process it, that lowered production costs, um, you know, you still have an overall decline of high quality hemp after World War I. And ultimately hemp's use as a fiber crop was completely crippled by politics. Um, cotton, you know, it again just amazes me but cotton being huge in the southern states and um, I don't know. There, I couldn't tell you why, why people were like, we should have cotton instead of hemp. I guess it just really slowly lies on the fact that it's hemp is related to marijuana 
and people were just like, you know, we're not going to be the awful people that have marijuana, so we're not going to have hemp. Um, but there were definitely politicians that get, got on on that, um, producers of synthetic fibers, you know, all together really just kind of ended the production of hemp. Um, so a little bit more detail on the Marijuana Tax Act that I mentioned a few slides ago. You know, you've got the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. Um, they you know, definitely wanted to regulate the narcotic varieties of cannabis, but they did not separate out hemp from can you know, marijuana. They called it all cannabis. And so um, <clears throat> the hemp growers need to be licensed, um, you know, needed to like prove that it wasn't marijuana. Um, and as I mentioned, for some growers, they had to pay a small tax, sign a paper stating they wouldn't use the plant as a drug, so it didn't maybe impact them too much. Um, it would have impacted smaller farmers. And then you also just have the politics of the cheap fibers coming in and you know, again have a red arrow pointing down because it decreased um, the use of hemp. So we actually again I said the history of hemp is very interesting because it's not just like a perfect downward you know spiral to us hating cannabis and all of its plants because World War II comes around and the U.S. kind of reversed its stance in 1942 when they realized they needed hemp for the war effort. The Department of Agriculture started to heavily promote hemp and started publishing various benefits that hemp offered um, like the findings that hemp produces four times more paper than, you know, per acre and then trees. Um, again, taking advantage of like, you know, putting out a promo before, um, you know, movies and things like that. The U.S. government released a pro-hemp documentary called Hemp for Victory, which encouraged farmers throughout the Midwest and Southeast to grow hemp to support the war. And this led to over 400,000 acres of hemp being planted during 1942 to 1945. So suddenly there's this reversal of, you know, we had been grouping it together with marijuana. They had been trying to get the production of it to decrease. And now suddenly World War II and we're saying, please everybody grow it. Um, so again, it was for a number of reasons um, for use, mostly the fiber, um, because they could use the fiber um, as they found out and making some of the like bodies of um, automobiles, airplanes, um, they probably needed them for some ships as well, for roping, rigging, that sort of thing. Not necessarily like the canvas for sails, but probably more the rope. Um, so it was a big campaign. It did, was pretty successful at convincing growers to again embrace hemp. Um, it also led to a few new hemp processing plants um, to, you know, again, be able to process that to get the fiber out to make the rope and the rigging. Um, but the war didn't last for a very long time. So before the project was like fully realized, you know, all of these new construction processing plants, the war ended. And so then the demand for fiber hemp basically went back to zip, zilch, nothing. Um, there were some empty or partially constructed plants and canceled hemp contracts. So in 1958, 
um, the last significant hemp crop was harvested and processed, and that kind of ended it. All right, um, just to kind of like give breaks between my videos and all the talking that I'm doing, I'm going to stop there. Um, and then I'm going to start up my next video and I'm actually going to pull up this YouTube video to show you parts of it. It's the Hump for Victory documentary. So I'll show you some of that and then we'll keep going through the history of hemp. So take a break, take a breather, um, or you can click on the next video if you're ready to keep pushing through.